introduction. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the GGE seminar. Happy new month. February's gone and we are into March. Uh, I'm Dr. Burkhart, and I did want to say that my first semester at Slippery Rock, I was being tasked to redevelop the curriculum in environmental geology. And interestingly, that class that I had that term, it numbered like 23 students, small, much smaller than I've had since. But I really imprinted on the character of many of those individuals. And I remember a guy named Eric Best, and he was a geography major. And he went on to get a job with DCNR and worked for decades at Jennings Environmental Education Center, which many of you guys know just down the road from the rock. So that immediately alerted me to the reality that the majors in our department can go ahead and pursue careers as park rangers. Um, and we learn all kinds of natural sciences and uh, geography and the, the ties of people to the landscape. And if you visited parks and you listen to the rangers give their interpretive descriptions, their content is rich with the kinds of expertise that we have inside of GGE. So I invited Nicole today, partly because I wanted to emphasize that uh, taking a job as a ranger is a viable career path for virtually every major that we have inside of our department. I remember meeting Nicole, I think it was the fall of 2013, would have been her first semester, if I'm not mistaken. Wow. And you graduated in 18, so the springs back would have been 14 in the previous fall, the fall 13. But anyhow, I remember distinctively meeting her and other students on a first year trip in that we ran to Letchworth State Park that year. And uh, I can't tell you for me personally, but I think it characterizes everyone in our department. We are just totally itching to get back to field trips. Mm -hmm. So from that first experience of getting to spend a weekend together on a really astounding landscape, Nicole then I think I had an additional course is probably hydrology. She graduated with her bachelor's in environmental geoscience track in environmental science in the spring of 2018. And I also remember that along the way, she was a very avid birder. <laughs> and in fact, we have many uh, alumni out of our department who are spectacular birders. Uh, so the fact that we are inter interdisciplinary naturalists to me is really, really cool. Um, and then recently on Facebook, I saw that Nicole uh, reached a milestone in her early career. So she is uh, entry level, you know, geoscientist who um, uh, has only graduated a few years ago. And she has a wonderful story to share today. So with no further ado, I give you Nikki Klimowitz. Hi, guys. Uh, like Dr. Burkhart said, I am Nikki Komolitz, graduated in 2018, geoscience, um, also had a minor in professional Spanish, so um, if you're looking for a minor that is outside your field, it is possible. Um, it was a big part of me, Spanish has always been a part of me, and honestly, in what I do now, which is partial law enforcement as well, um, come across a lot of times where I do have to use Spanish and it's pretty helpful when you are able to actually use a skill that you have learned over time. Uh, so basically, I don't have anything like fancy visuals today. Um, this is actually my first time on Zoom. <laughs> we haven't done much uh, when it comes to programs at all um, for my uh, job at the moment, just because of where I'm from, Erie County, which I'll go through that. Um, it's a little complicated in what we are and are not allowed to do. Um, and it always is changing like every other day, it feels like. So um, for now, this is our first time kind of just getting an experience with Zoom and getting back into like a spring program um, ideas is our biggest thing right now. So basically um, to begin, I am so I went to school in Pennsylvania, but I actually, I grew up and I'm currently living in Erie County, New York, 
Um, so if you don't know where Erie County, New York is, it's around where Buffalo is specifically. Um, and it'll go from anywhere from up by Niagara Falls, Niagara County is up top, and down below is Allegheny County and like um, all of those fun, like the reservation, Angola and places like that. Um, and that will take you straight down. It's pretty much a straight shot back down into Pennsylvania. So we're not as fancy as Erie PA, <laughs> but we do get about as much snow. So um, this year has been probably the most snow we've had in the past few years, um, which is good. It's nice to know the world can still produce enough snow. <laughs> um, and especially as um, in my job now as a park ranger, um, we have a huge winter sports um, in the wintertime here. So we have skiing, snowmobiling, all that fun stuff, ice skating rinks all throughout our parks. So that's a big plus when we actually have snow to provide <laughs> to our patrons throughout the county. Uh, so basically to begin, I kind of wanted to just go over what I did after graduating. I mean, it's only been about three-ish years um, and it was a long, hard process, but it was worth it. I learned a lot along the way. And basically I always tell people, you don't always have to go to grad school. I didn't go to grad school. Sometimes it helps um, with maybe specifics, but for me, mine was, I wanted to be in the field. I wanted to get out there and kind of start getting that hands-on experience. I wanted to be out of school and working with the public more. Um, so that was my big thing. I'm a huge people person. So that was the biggest thing for me. Um, like I said, I did minor in Spanish. So if you get that experience, I don't know if they're doing that nowadays, but studying abroad is amazingly good for your self-esteem. It's good for just making you a more worldly pe people. Um, so I studied abroad the year before I graduated. So I had gotten into my minor with a year and a half left in my undergrad. And I was like, I don't wanna stay here longer than four years. So I went to Spain for a month during the summer and I jumped ahead and I got farther than I expected. I got to experience um, the whole, country of Spain, let alone speaking Spanish with the people um, teaching me and the people in my neighborhood. Um, and Slippery Rock offers a great study abroad program, affordable. I was able to pay for it, make it part of my own um, program in general, which was really awesome and helped me also graduate on time with a minor. Um, plus a lot of the times, like for me, professional Spanish the biggest part about it was taking that language and putting it towards your degree. So basically they were teaching me ways of putting my degree and my Spanish into one. So how am I gonna use Spanish in environmental science? Um, which was pretty cool. And it, I've actually experienced a lot of it here and being able to talk to a lot of Spanish families that come to experience the parks that we have, which are some pretty awesome old parks. Um, so basically after I graduated, um, I did thank God a lot <laughs> for uh, the Rocks resources. So if you haven't been to the Career Center yet, um, and I'm sure they've talked about it a lot, I highly recommend. I waited till my last year to do it, but if you can get on top of that sooner rather than later, it is the best thing. The Rock is awesome in helping you find and get into learning about cover letters and learning about how to get your resume written right and practicing interviews and things like that. So The Rock has some awesome resources that definitely take advantage of. Um, and you'll become a pro at cover letters. I've written a lot of them. <laughs> um, and a lot of times, yeah, you can keep it as simple as possible, but that's the coolest part is you just become a pro at a lot of things and you you look back and you thank The Rock a lot for giving you the re resources and references you needed to get you to that point at slowly getting there. It takes time, but as long as you don't like sit back and not try, you'll get somewhere. And I mean, I did it in 
a year and a half. So, and that's pretty good <laughs> for people who didn't go to grad school. Um, so a lot of times, like what I did is I had a lot of things bookmarked on my computer. So websites. So my biggest thing, USA Jobs always has some type of job fields up and about. LinkedIn surprisingly has some great job opportunities on there as well, which The Rock helps you get really good at LinkedIn. Um, at least Career Center did. Um, and I actually applied for a lot of jobs through LinkedIn. Uh, my biggest one for me was like Texas A&M was huge. They have a job board for everything from environmental science, geoscience, geology, and that takes you anywhere in the country. Um, and I actually applied to a lot of places like that as well. And um, job boards uh, through the state, the county always has something. You can look even into specifics like me, like Dr. Burkhardt said, I am huge into birds. Um, I did an internship my sophomore year of college um, at a wildlife center at here in Buffalo um, that worked with like hawks and giant birds of prey and things like that and like large cats. So that was a huge opportunity and internships are huge, even though, yes, not being paid stinks. <laughs> But the opportunities and just that experience is in the end what makes it better. Um, so a lot of times, even just Googling like jobs working in the birding field comes up with a lot of websites that will just link you to jobs. And that's actually in the end how I came up with my first job, which I'll get into shortly. Um, a big thing I've discovered over time is that connections are key. So once you make a connection with somebody in any kind of field, keep that connection, keep in contact with them, be friends with them on Facebook, things like that. Um, that's what I've discovered, especially getting this job. Connections are a huge thing. Um, and especially if you're looking into government type jobs, that's another big thing, connections. You always want to kind of know somebody to begin with because helps out a lot. Um, my favorite thing I used to do, um, Erie County's fair in New York, um, we have a conservation building and that's where you would find the Department of Environmental Conservation, U.S. Fish and Wildlife and other like places like that. Um, another place we have, which is part of the Department of Environmental Conservation is Reinstein Woods, which is located right here as well. Um, and basically they, I'd go kind of just show my face every year, get to know whoever was at the booth, collect more information I never got. I know the US Fish and Wildlife for a long time was in a hiring freeze, but it was still, I made sure I got there. I introduced myself. I let them know what I went to school for. Just making that kind of connection is a big deal because if you can get your name known, even without having that job, that's huge. If, if they're going to recognize you from just showing up and talking to them, it's a really big deal. Um, and don't be afraid to follow certain companies on social media. Um, a lot of them will post their own jobs. I know my department now um, in Parks and Recreation, we post job opportunities anytime they come up on Twitter, Facebook, anything like that. We post them up all the time, just because sometimes you can't access it in any other way. Um, so that's a huge thing. Um, but like I said, just apply for any and everything. And that's what I did. It's just the keep your head up high and keep applying. Um, so that's how actually I came across my first job. Um, it was a, another bird job. It was a waterfowl conservation um, group in Connecticut. So I worked closely with ducks, geese, swan, um, and we had a few birds of prey. Um, so basically I got hired there for a six month internship, um, moved out to Connecticut for six months. They had housing for me. I got paid 400 bucks a month, which is what food. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I got pretty lucky with this one and it was probably the most amazing experience 
hands-on. I was feeding. I was out there with the ducks. I learned a crazy amount of species I didn't even know existed, um, let alone like species from around the world. And the biggest thing we learned was I was there from January to July. So that is the breeding season for ducks. So I got to do the whole incubate the eggs. Um, once they hatch, we take care of them from young and things like that. So I got to do that whole entire process. Um, I even got the opportunity to imprint um, one of the little ducks to become an education bird because we did education programs as well. Um, so that one was cool. Other than a tiny baby duck waking you up four times in the middle of the night to be fed. <laughs> it's like having a child you never wanted. <laughs> But it was a cool experience just getting to get that hands on, really became attached um, to a lot of the animals there um, and just experiencing different programs they did. And like even this um, Waterfowl Conservancy, they also did a summer program where they do a summer camp with kids as well. So you got everything from working with children and people to giving tours and doing um, aviculture and things like that. So I got that really cool hands-on experience to write down and learned the proper ways to care for different types of birds from all over the world. So my biggest thing is that is hands-on experience is key. Um, it's going to teach you to become better with people. I know I gave a lot of tours. I had to know every species in that place and they had over 125 piece species. Um, so I need to know all the species and a little bit about each, a fun fact of each, basically. Um, and with that, it came down to giving a tour. So you had to really kind of be a people person. Also, not be afraid to mess up because they do that often <laughs> and kind of just laugh it off because people would rather you be a human than a robot is what I've discovered when you come down to working with the public. They'd rather see you laughing with them and kind of making that personal connection is huge. And that's what I've really kind of grown into a lot was people are the biggest part of your job, no matter what, um, at least in my field. Um, Cause I work with people almost every day, um, whether it's in a good sign or a bad sign. <laughs> um, and then my biggest thing, especially when you're first looking for jobs is don't be afraid to leave home. It's gonna stink, sure, if you are big at being home. I mean, I love Buffalo, that's why I came back. <laughs> um, but don't be afraid to leave home and get that experience as well because that changes your experience and it changes your expectations in what you can do. Um, and realizing that you're okay leaving home is huge in your career because then you're a little bit more flexible and that's a big deal. So I always tell people get away from home at least for a little bit. I mean, yeah, I was away from home for college, which was awesome, but getting away for a job where you can't come home for breaks or things like that was definitely needed. Um, and that's the biggest thing is you don't give up on the job search. Even when you're in a job, you're always looking, um, always keeping updated, things like that. Um, odd jobs are awesome. So after I came back from Connecticut, I got a odd job slightly outside of where I lived. Another birding thing that was more of a, um, I guess you could say I was the only worker <laughs> for this very old couple um, who had hundreds of um, ducks and they bred them as well. So I had that experience to kind of bring in, kind of showed them some different ideas from a younger perspective since they were both like 80. Um, and kind of just, I learned that and I learned a little bit more from them because she's, the owner was very, very experienced. Um, she'd been doing it her whole life. Um, so that's the biggest thing is don't, don't give up on odd jobs. They are huge because they actually, they're those resume builders, but they also kind of keep you grounded because it keeps you motivated as well. Um, so then I got extremely lucky with the job I have currently, which is like my main portion of 
my talk today was uh, I am an Erie County Park Ranger. So we are a very, very new program here in Erie County. We began in 2015 um, with three rangers were hired, including my supervisor here. Um, and basically we were hired just to become more of a look out for the parks. We became part of like law enforcement because the parks were sort of coming back into popularity um, and things like that. And things were just kind of getting out of hand in general and certain things kind of needed more regulation. So we started off as based off of um, three pillars, which is our education, our law enforcement, and our ecology, environmental science, conservation stuff. Um, so basically those were the three things we were based off of. Um, <laughs> sorry, my radio is getting funky. Um, so basically in the end, we range throughout the entire county. So our jurisdiction is from up to Niagara County, which is a park called Akron, is our highest up north park all the way down to Springville, which is right on the outskirts to an area called Scobie Dam or Sprague Brook Park. Those are probably our most Southern versus our most Northern. Um, total, we range, there's four of us now, four total park rangers, and we range over 38 total parks that we go and check out on. Um, a lot of our parks do get a lot of large crowds, such as the one I'm stationed at right now is Chestnut Ridge. Um, and this is located in Orchard Park. Um, so if you know the bills, we're in that area. <laughs> um, from everywhere from our busy parks, which are Chestnut, Como Lake, and Lancaster, Ellicott Creek, Emory Park, more of our, what we call our heritage parks, um, to our forestry lots that are more of a park that's used to keep nature as simple as possible, um, kind of untouched by the public. Um, so we've got a nice general range all over. Um, and I've been to almost, mo I've been to most of them. There's a few of our forestry lots I haven't completely explored yet. Um, I did get this job about a little over a year ago. I started December 16th, 2020. I believe. Nope, 2019. So uh, that was about a year ago now. Um, and then COVID hit, so that was fun. Um, and needless to say, we're busy in the summer, but summer started early for us once COVID hit. Summer started in April instead of June. So it was a very busy 2020 season. Um, and especially in the summer, we range all over the place. Um, especially in Hamburg, we've got beaches out by um, closer to Angola. So we've got Went Beach and Bennett Beach. And those ones are out and they get very populated in the summertime. So we spend a lot of time at those. And up north, we've got a lot of very busy time up at Akron Falls because it's just, it's an interesting phenomenon up there as well. So it just becomes very packed. And mind you, with four rangers and an entire county to run in the summertime, it's harder than it seems, but we make it work and we've done pretty good so far. So to start off, our biggest thing is um, we were brought on kind of as a law enforcement base, hence the fancy uniform. <laughs> um, so we don't do as much as like a cop or a sheriff would, but we do have rules in the parks that we expect people to follow. So I was, um, I went to the Peace Officer Academy. Um, mine was supposed to start back last March. So that was a long time ago. And that got canceled because when it comes to peace officer training, it's a lot of hands-on um, practice, kind of like a police academy. Um, but we have a little less um, authority, I guess, from police, even though we're very much the same. Um, so I started my Peace Officer Academy back in September. And basically there we learn everything from the penal law 
all the books, um, learned defensive tactics, um, which was very interesting, especially as one of the only females in my entire group and graduating class. Um, I was one of, I was the only female. So it was nice to take down the boys. <laughs> um, we got sprayed with um, OCs or um, pepper spray. So that we, a lot of things that we do carry on our belts, which I'll stand up and show you. So here we've got a baton, just in case, handcuffs, OC spray, radio, and handcuff keys. So basically we're taught how to use that, what it feels like so that problems don't occur <laughs> and we don't overtake our own powers which is shocking to me still. Um, but we learned everything from penal law. I learned a lot that I didn't know um, and things like that. And first aid is huge. We are a major part of first aid. Um, we are considered first responders, especially in the winter time and summertime. Um, winter time, we'll have a lot of fun first aids on the hill. Sledding is a very dangerous game. <laughs> but um, so we've learned a lot about that first aids um, and what I need and need, not need to know. And that's always growing and adding on. Um, and basically our park rules are huge. Um, you'll find out which ones you notice more often. You get a lot of regulars. You, you really get to know people, which is pretty cool, especially in certain parks. You always find out, oh, I know, I know that guy. He's the guy that runs all the time. So you, you really get to know the people in your parks, which is awesome. Um, the other thing we do, another big thing is um, our education. So with the COVID in the last 2020, we didn't have as many education programs as we usually would. Um, summertime is huge for those programs. We like to do um, Wednesdays, we call them hump day hikes, which get a lot of traction. Um, and that's a lot of the programs. Um, people like to get out and be out there in person with people. Um, another big program we actually do in the winter, which we didn't get to do as much this year, it's been pretty busy, was um, we do Sunday snowshoe hikes. So um, one of our cafes here, they lent, um, rent out snowshoes and we can get decent amount of crowds. Um, and snowshoeing and winter sports here are huge. Um, not snowshoeing, you've got cross country skiing is a big one here as well. So we try to make it where people are getting out and active, but also learning a lot about our parks and about nature. So that's like a lot of our programs are talking with people and getting them to know our parks and how to use them properly. Um, so we do hikes. Um, my biggest thing right now is I'm learning the histories of all of our parks. Um, and like I mentioned, our heritage parks a little bit a while ago. Um, that would include, we have five main heritage parks. So Chestnut Ridge, Emory Park, Ellicott Creek, Como Lake, and Akron Falls. So those five parks are actually the first five parks we ever had in our park system. Um, they were all brought into our system back in about the 1930s. Um, and most of the buildings you would see in these parks are made of stone, um, which was actually created and built by a lot of workers um, in the WPA. Um, so basically they were paid during that time to help kind of create a safe space for people to go gather picnics, um, giant baseball games, fun things like that. So that's a huge thing you'll see in our histories. And I'm working on a few programs and coming up with the histories of each thing, getting in contact with people that are giving me more information that you would never know existed about these parks because over time it does disappear. Um, so that's a huge one we're trying to get people to realize is how old these parks really are. They've been around a long time. Uh, we work pretty closely with the Boys and Girls Scouts um, with trail markings. So we're working on one of our own parks right now is called Franklin Golf. Um, and right now we're working on 
we created, we have a trail system that is a little complicated. So we're kind of making it a little bit easier to follow, adding in, um, actually have examples. These fancy little things you hang up on trees with numbers. So that also if anyone happens to get lost on the way, they can report where they're at and tell us what color and what number they're at. So that we can find them a whole lot easier than them saying, I'm here. And you're like, I have no idea. <laughs> so that one we've been working very closely with the Girl Scouts, getting them involved. Um, they get they'll get a patch for helping us as well. So they're learning the ideas of distance that we put those um, markers up, how to properly put them up, screwing them into trees properly, how to leave space so that they can tree can still grow. Um, putting up the stickers on there, all that fun stuff, measuring. So they've got this really awesome hands-on, plus they're learning not only the history of the park, but also random nature that we find along the way that I'll just bring up or talk about. Um, they always like to know about the trees. What tree am I drilling into? <laughs> Very big deal. Um, and then we actually get a lot of older senior groups um, that have actually been very helpful. They help plant uh, flowers. They've helped me on trails as well, um, working on backing out some of these trail markers, because after a while, you do have to back them out a little bit more so that the tree can continue to grow. Um, so we, we get a nice variety of people that want to join us and be a part of our groups. Um, and then our biggest thing is um, ecology and environment conservation. So that there is a lot of invasives throughout the world. Um, and one we really keep an eye on here is called hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, so they're those little tiny white bugs you'll find underneath a uh, hemlock on their branches. So we actually have a forester here that works with us in our program. Um, and we actually have a forestry area out in Sardinia, which is closer to Springville area towards the Southern border of Erie County. And he is, he's the expert when it comes to it. We do go out with him. Um, I've done my own surveys of certain areas in the park where you experience um, just looking for those bugs, which is hard when they're very tiny and little white bugs and you're looking up in a white sky. <laughs> so I really learned kind of what to look for. Um, and especially with other diseases, um, We've all heard about the American chestnut and the devastation that has occurred ever since anything happened with them. Um, so we have actually here, um, Chestnut Ridge, my, our main, our biggest park, um, was actually originally named for the chestnut trees that used to grow on the hills here. So it used to be filled until of course the blight came and all the trees passed away and we actually ended up we made sure you don't just tear them down and burn them we actually used a lot of that wood for infrastructure throughout the park um which you can find in a few of our um older shelters as well which is kind of cool that american chestnuts are still kind of around um even if they are being used for infrastructure so we have um a chestnut tree um program that we do um, we collect data. We have a few small young trees. They're hybrids between the Chinese and the American um, to see if maybe they can possibly survive because they are good and bad between that and just the hopes that maybe they will continue to grow. So last summer, early summer, um, I had actually gone out to all of our trees here at Chestnut Ridge and checked for blight. Um, which is basically that peeling of the bark, that orangey looking skin on the bark is, shows that the blight is occurring. Um, and just basically checked on the health of these trees, cleaned them up, weeded them. So that was like something huge we do. We do a lot of hands-on things like that. Um, and the other ones we always look for is spotted lantern flies are coming. <laughs> they are coming and they get closer and closer every day. Um, so that's another one we're keeping an eye out and educating the public on. Um, and same with, um, we've all heard of the gypsy moth. 
And although she is a beauty, they are very bad for trees. If you ever see that tan looking patch on a tree, scrape it right off. We always recommend, we always, if we're on a hike and we notice that we educate and we show them the best way to do it because she might be a beauty, but she is dangerous. <laughs> So another cool thing, um, Erie County Parks do, which a lot of places you won't know would even do this, is our forestry lots have a lot of trees that we tap. And right now is maple syrup season. So right now, a lot of our maintenance guys um, are out there, got their snowshoes on, tapping trees. Um, and out in those forestry lots that I told you about, you'll see um, if you ever come and visit, uh, there's these blue and white tubes throughout all the trees and it's quite a business. <laughs> um, so that's a huge thing that a lot of people don't realize is us in Erie County, our department actually does their own um, maple syrup production and we sell it as well. It's very delicious. Um, so a big thing um, we're working on now um is like I said the trail marking and the park histories but the big thing even you guys out where you guys are can check out for if you're interested is salamander migration huge big awesome thing um and me and my one co-worker are very excited about it <laughs> we did started it last year and we're hopefully continuing on this year and it's it's fun to get out there and get hands-on data with the salamanders. Um, so some of the big things I wanna talk about before we come to end, if you guys ever find yourself out. Oh yeah, I can explain a little bit more about the salamander migration, sure. Um, so the salamander migration is basically, um, now that it's warming up or slowly getting there, salamander migration is anywhere from March to like May. Um, so basically, as it warms up, these salamanders are starting to come out of the mud, come out of their like turbidity and get out of their like, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of just like solid death. <laughs> they just kind of hang out and they just disappear for a bit. And uh, they're finally coming out and you'll, a lot of times you'll see them going from a higher elevation to a lower or vice versa. So they're looking for um water areas shallow water not flowing too much um so basically vernal pools um and anything where they can get some grubs and they're going out and they're going to look for a mate and start spreading their eggs out so basically when we're out there checking them out we have these cool nets that we set up at night um where we're hoping that we can at least collect some male or females um, and just kind of get data from them um, and what kinds we're getting. So we've got everything from the fancy Jefferson salamander, which is gray with blue spots to um, little tiny brown ones. I'm not the expert, my coworker is. <laughs> so I'm trying to read chats as I go. So when they, we don't tag them, um, a lot of times you can actually with salamanders, just like a lot of lizards, you can actually um, take a little bit of their tail off um, and test that type of stuff. Um, and they can migrate, hmm, how far? Usually it's like across the road. They don't go too far. Um, they like, usually once they're in a good place, they'll like stick around in that spot. Um, so that's the biggest thing there. Let's see. The cocoon. Oh yeah, it's basically like fibers. That question was about the gypsy moth. And yeah. earlier, there was a question about whether or not you've actually had the pepper spray, anybody who was a unruly. <laughs> Me currently not at the moment. I have not had any experience with that yet. But I have my one coworker said the only time she's ever had a possibility of using it was when she got a little too close to a coyote. So luckily it does work on 
animals as well, uh, certain animals, of course, but she's like, that's, that was the only time she's had that experience, but usually not. We like to try and use our good old words <laughs> and our lovely um, people skills before we have to jump into anything too intense. So that's the biggest thing there. Um, de-escalate, de-escalate. Yeah, de-escalate um, with words always first until words don't work anymore. But usually the biggest thing they taught me in academy was words are your friend. As long as you're using the right ones, you shouldn't have a problem. Um, any other questions before I give examples about some cool parks and places in the parks we can check out? All right, cool. So big one, I know um, Dr. Burkhart has a lot of um, a place up in Rushford. So he might be out this way. And if anyone is ever interested out this way, um, few cool places you can definitely check out. Um, our biggest one that I'll mention first is Chestnut Ridge. Um, it's our largest park named after the chestnut trees. Um, to and we're trying to fight that blight, but the hybrids that I mentioned, but the coolest thing we have right now that used to be a secret and is no longer a secret because someone had to go write about it in a book is called the Eternal Flame. Um, so this natural gas phenomena is in our park and it's actually a little mini cave underneath the waterfall at the bottom of a, our shale creek um at the bottom of shale creek so basically everywhere around here um almost all of our creeks or anything like that the stone is all shale so not only that it's very stinky <laughs> And you'll notice that if you come here, but the eternal flame is called the eternal flame basically because it is a cave that's dug, well not dug, it's naturally um, indented underneath a waterfall and you can actually light it on fire. When, if it goes out, we do light it with a match or a um, lighter. And this waterfall just, is eternal it's constantly going um excuse me so basically it was called this just because the craziest <laughs> oh no you actually won't because this doesn't have heat you can't feel heat it's not gonna explode it's been there for no one knows how long it no the scientists that have explored it have called it no hotter than a cup of tea so basically you see air bubbles coming out of the ground. It is this phenomena that no one understands. There's still very little known about it. I don't even know much about it other than <laughs> it's made from the natural gas. And um, there's most likely some type of tunnel that goes down into that area um, or was used for natural gas production at some point, but it is not hot. It is, um, smelly but that's about all you're gonna get lighting it doesn't actually cause any kind of burst it just kind of lights um and even along that creek itself um if the creek is running enough you see air bubbles coming up so the whole area is filled with natural gas um but it's so little that it's you would never even know oh miss shiapa you did too cool yeah it's probably the coolest location it's gotten a lot of traction now. So there is a lot of issues um, just because the erosion has become so intense. Um, and it used to be a major secret. Um, and then a book was written about the secret places in Western New York, which thanks, let's give that away. Like we didn't want people to know about it, but it's fine. <laughs> so yeah, so it's all the black shale you've got and it's actually called Shell Creek Preserve. Um, and it used to be um, like UB or University of Buffalo is a big thing. Um, basically they had sent scientists and so many people are just so baffled by it that it's just kind of this thing people go and check out and it's even cooler in the winter, but highly recommend you wear some kind of picks or snowshoes because it is icy and you do have to walk up the creek to get to it so it's got a trail down to the creek and then you walk back up the creek so we do a lot of 
fun things there. Um, so that's a big one that I always recommend because um, we like to educate people on that. Um, my biggest one that especially you rock lovers might like um, is at 18 Mile, which is around Hamburg area. 18 Mile Creek is one of the longest running creeks in Western New York. Um, it flows right into Erie, um, Lake Erie. And we actually have a fishing access location there. Um, there's everything from our 18 mile creek to there's also another 18 mile creek that um, is where a lot of kayakers launch, which is closer to the lake. Um, so basically our 18 mile is a little bit farther inland um, and we have fishing access there. A lot of people find um, anything from trout to there's, they get a little bit of everything. Yes. You can still collect fossils. We are actually looking into doing a, hopefully a fossil program. Um, we've wanted, we've been wanting to get in, well, we have been in contact with Penn Dixie and kind of learning the fossils throughout that area and throughout another one of our parks, which is huge. Um, and in case, um, and Dr. Schiappa, have you ever noticed the stromatolites throughout that park? Yes, yes, I have. Yes, so that is a huge thing that we are um, yeah. noticing and educating on right now, which is amazing. Yeah, it's it's a beautiful. It's I a beautiful a, park. I didn't know it was a park now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, when I was, when yeah, I'd been there, it wasn't a park. Uh, yeah, and a lot of our parks are slowly coming in. Um, basically, in the past, I would say 50 years overall, um, but they slowly are becoming more populated um by people knowing about them so and especially with covid our biggest thing was well us park rangers were like no please <laughs> don't come to the park all at once but it was the biggest thing people wanted to do sure. was get out check out different parks that a lot of them didn't know about such as 18 mile and franklin golf which is another big one with the shale mm -hmm. and where we're doing a lot of our um trail marking right now so and that's a nice park too. It's a great park. Um, so all of them are really awesome. Um, and the trails are at 18 mile are awesome. You have an upper trail, which is, you get all panoram panoramic views and see the coolness about that. And then things from down below, you get the stromatolites, you can find some fossils, great fishing, great birds. I've seen many a bald eagle down there. Um, so that's, that's the biggest thing with 18 mile, um, with climate change education, uh, we're trying to get into that, but a lot of times we focus on what we can in our parks. Um, and with, I'm at least I am at least trying to get people to realize, um, basically what we're experiencing as weather and everything nowadays is not normal. <laughs> Um, and a lot of people don't realize that. Um, and I'm trying to just even trying to get into seminars like this, hence why I, one, agreed to do this, because one, I want to see all your beautiful faces, but also <laughs> um, getting to kind of get used to maybe doing Zoom seminars and doing kind of lessons that we can do virtually and get more people involved in. Um, so that would be an awesome thing to be involved in. Um, what kind of just, changes? Are you, are you seeing anything specific? Um, not as, well, unless, except for this year, it hasn't been as cold in the winter time. Mm -hmm. um, just weather events that are not uh, normal. Extreme, <laughs> extreme weather events. Extreme yeah. weather events that people don't realize, oh, but it's winter time, but not like this. It's not supposed yeah. to be sunny in 80 one day and freezing the next. So I'm, I would like to do anything like that. Um, vegetation changes. We're seeing, I guess, we notice a lot more algae and types of mosses, at least when we're out hiking. Um, we like to get into that. Mushrooms, we are very specific on what things we're looking at right now. So our big thing is um, whatever we're focused on. I know my one coworker is big in mushrooms. Um, so she's learning about all those. 
And we each have like our own project we learn about. Um, and that's the thing, we want to come up with more ideas and education that's not just law enforcement based. And that's what a lot of us signed up for is the educating of um, people that come to our parks. Hence why we also, um, with those chestnut trees, we talk about that a lot and how the blight and different types of bugs that come in. And that's the big thing that we're trying to work at. Um, Try to think of anything else that we've noticed so far. Nicole, is it, it yeah? Is it possible that the um, blight and the insect infestation <laughs> is increasing due to climate change? Um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, about it, but the blight probably not, but certain um, algae is probably certain types of things that are attacking the trees and that we're finding, um, very, very possible. I mean, this is our first time we're ever probably gonna see spotted lanternflies in Western New York is slowly on our horizons. It's getting closer and closer. <laughs> I think the closest one is um, in Gold, somewhere close by. It's one of the stops along New York. It's coming from Albany and coming this way. So. We're just kind of preparing for that. And um, and I've noticed, I've never noticed it growing up, but those um, cocoons, the gypsy moth cocoons on the trees, I see them everywhere now um, that I never noticed growing up um, in this area. And just a lot of larger wind events that we didn't expect and things that we've never expected to come out. Um, so that's like the biggest thing. I'm we're keeping our eyes eyes open for different changes, um, but it's been so busy this year. We haven't gotten to do as much as we usually do out and about. So hopefully we can. We're learning more as we go as well. We're always learning. Um, but even this is like great practice too with people I'm comfortable with before I can bring people into another seminar sure. and teach them closer about certain specifics. So are you are you collecting are you collecting this data and keeping it and then planning on, you know, comparing what you see in certain areas over time? Um, yeah, there's certain things we've worked on over time, such as that um, hemlock woolly adelgid um, is a huge one we keep track of. Mm -hmm. So we keep track of certain areas, especially at Chestnut Ridge here. We have a lot of hemlocks, um, so we keep that um, process. I have more. One second. Let me check my. And and while you're looking, do you have a citizen science program that where you maybe educate the, you know, your, the public to kind of help with collecting that data? Right. So for you, I would think it'd be possible. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing with um, Western New York actually has a lot of their own programs. So we have our own waterkeeper programs and our own um, prism and things like that. That do their own data, but we also keep in touch with them. So we, we're we kind of more of a part of their group than them being a part of us. Um, so that's like a big thing we work on, um, such as like the salamander thing is huge. We like to collect that data, see if they are leaving this area or not, if they like this area or not. Sometimes it's, last year we only got five, but each year is different. Um, some of the major projects I've worked on, so far at least. Let me just point out, Nikki, that probably some students will be yeah. leaving for classes soon. So that is totally fine. Before everybody tapers off, I want to thank you for spending the time with us and preparing thank your you. thoughts. <laughs> and uh, let you know that we will convert this into a YouTube video. Yeah, I'll, awesome. I'll get you that link and your uh, influence will spread farther than what you see in the gallery. <laughs> Good, I'm glad. And the biggest thing for those before y'all leave, um, um, if you are graduating soon, don't don't push yourself too much. Remember, it takes time. It will take time, but not lose hope in it because you never know when an opportunity pops up. This one was a shock. This one was one I found out 
and from my own mother and basically applied. And I just got, I got extremely lucky. I got an interview. I've never been so excited. This, even in my interview process and after the interview process, when they offered me the job, I had to ask them if they were serious because I was, <laughs> I was in so much shock when they said I was the one that got the job. It was super exciting. So always remember like, it will take time, but if you keep working at it and you don't give up at all, it comes out in the best of ways. And if you like people, get more specific into what jobs you're looking for, but always keep your options open. I mean, I look everywhere and anywhere. That's what I did and it works out in the end. So highly recommend. <laughs> Thanks for joining me. If you have any questions, feel free to check it out or stay with me and all that. So thanks guys. But back to some programs, because I'll talk about whoever's left for a little bit, is um, a lot of the times we will do a lot of programs we already have would be those chestnut trees, the watering and the survivability and such. Um, let's see. We are slowly learning about certain other programs and learning what's in our parks still, even to this day. It's a new thing. Um, we are discovering more and more owls throughout our park um, and kind of just coming up with ideas and programs to convince our higher ups to allow us to do night programs and things like that. So the hardest part is to is the permission I've learned, but it doesn't mean you give up. You always come back with more options, more ideas, and you're constantly brainstorming is what I've discovered is a big thing we always do is um, we constantly, I constantly have a project idea spreadsheet on my computer, always ready to go. Um, so not only am I working closely with our constant off-leash dog walkers <laughs> and all those fun things, we're also learning about different projects and realizing what's in each of our parks that we can work on. So I've got like chestnut tree data, um, blown up maps of certain sections of the park for HWA. Um, we've looked at common birds for, um, we do birding projects. Um, we've done a lot of surveyors. So I've, I've gotten to do a lot of surveys and work closely with surveyors um, at certain parks as well, which was really cool. Um, and especially even a small park, just to see how they do it. And basically being a part of that is super cool. And a big thing we do in certain times are we go and walk the entire perimeter of certain parks and we put up our posted signs, basically, letting know hunters and um, all of our lovely ATV friends um, don't enter. <laughs> oh, but they still do. But it's still fun to at least be out there, you're walking the perimeter, you're learning the different ups and downs of the park. I didn't even realize that certain parks had. Um, and it, it just keeps you on your toes. It's something different every day. Um, and I think personally, my favorite part of my job is the amount of people I get to talk to and educate every day. Um, even if we're not doing programs, if I'm out and they, someone catches me walking, a lot of times they're like, oh my gosh, what you up to today? And I'm like, you see this? It's pretty cool. And I just kind of explain it. And that's sometimes that's all someone wants is a nice little chat. And it's, it's really cool in that aspect. Um, and that's always been my favorite part was speaking with people um, and being a people person. So this helps. People aren't always afraid of the badge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to thank you. That was a really wonderful note to end on. Yes, the olive, olive branch of peace and the, the uh, spark of interest in getting people to engage deeply with nature in their backyard. It's a really valuable service. Mm -hmm. If the citizens don't value the landscape, then we're all in trouble. So exactly. We definitely appreciate your outreach efforts. Yes. Well, thank you once again, Nikki. And I really appreciate you coming and chatting with us and I'll follow up with you afterwards. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? If not, I'm going to head out. Yeah, I got a couple questions. Yeah, um, go ahead. So Back to when you said like you got a duckling to imprint on you, what kind of duck was it? Okay, so that guy was a Puna Teal. 
Um, he is native to South America. Um, and basically he turns in, he gets this bright blue bill. He's a oh. really beautiful dog. Um, but yeah, that one was cool. Now when you got to make sure you catch them at the right time as they're hatching, the first thing they have to see is your face. So. So is there any particular reason why you chose a teal? Uh, that was just what they wanted. They wanted, oh, okay. they had a, they already had a goose um, that was imprinted and they had a bunch of wildlife. They didn't have any ducks yet, but Puna teals are cool because they do have that blue bill and they're just kind of different looking. Um, and a lot of people don't know about them because they're not North American. So, and who doesn't love a baby duck? That's true. <laughs> Except for at 4 a.m. when he's crying for food. But yeah, there was no particular reason we picked a Puna teal. It was just one of the first species that hatched. I think that was the choice behind it. So, yeah, he was cool. His name's Sammy. If you're ever at Connecticut, in Connecticut, check out Ripley Waterfowl Conservancy. He should be there. My, my, my next big trip is going to be to go back and visit because I missed that little duck. <laughs> then my next question is going to be like, yeah. in these chestnut tree areas that have just been wiped out by the blight, mm -hmm. what kind of like operations are you guys doing to like help the population? Are you grafting trees? Are you like clearing land to like just let chestnuts grow? I don't know. So no, that's a good question. Um, we actually have throughout our park. So Chestnut Ridge Park itself is over um, 10,000 acres of land. And we have a lot of open area throughout it. So we actually have them dispersed in different areas throughout the park. So from everywhere from the upper end of the park to the very lower end of the park. So it's got a chance in a little bit of every location. Um, and with these guys, they start off as saplings and they're the hybrids. So they're all Chinese um, American mix because Americans are gonna die no matter what. They, none of them have ever been able to grow here since the blight like arrived. Um, so we're starting to slowly get into this hybrid mix. Um, and basically they're just throughout the park in open areas that may or may not help a tree or and the tree would be fine there um, if it did grow to maturity. So that's basically what we're working at. So they're all still saplings, excuse me. They were all planted maybe a few years ago. Um, and a lot of them are still alive today. I actually went through and checked most of them um, and did a database for it. And basically we check, we mulch them, we weed them. Um, and just see if they are still living or not. Um, and we check once a year. Um, and I'm trying to think how many we have. We have quite a few. Um, so basically that's what we do. We just have them throughout the park to try different locations. Um, and just to see if the hybrid's gonna even stick. Um, so it's still a pretty new project, but if it does work, I'm hoping we can spread it out, but we shall see. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much, Nicole. No that was spectacular. I do appreciate you coming and spending time with yes, us. Thank Alrighty. you very much. It meant a lot. It was good Alrighty. to see you all. I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting. I'll follow right. up with you. Sounds good. Thanks.